Just kidding. Hope I didn't lose you there. I'm Dee Dee West. Welcome to Broken Limelight, where I'll be telling stories about true crime among celebrities like Hollywood stars and famous rock and rollers. Today I want to talk about Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye is known for some of the greatest Motown hits of all time, such as Let's Get It On, Heard It Through the Grapevine, Sexual Healing, and quite a few others. Marvin Gaye has earned the titles of the Prince of Motown and the Prince of Soul. So let's get right to Marvin's story. Marvin Gaye was born on April 2nd, 1939 to his parents Alberta and Marvin Gaye Sr. He was their second of four children. Marvin's mother, Alberta, was a domestic worker. She was known to be warm and kind and worked very hard. In fact, Marvin Sr. was known to not be able to hold a job for very long. So, Alberta worked really hard cleaning people's houses. This was one of many reasons that Marvin grew to be resentful towards his father. As he grew up, Marvin and his father didn't get along, and Alberta would kind of play referee during fights between the two of them. In fact, Alberta even had her own bedroom in between Marvin and Marvin Sr.'s bedrooms. Alberta and Marvin were very close, and Marvin Sr. seemed jealous of that relationship. Marvin Sr. was a preacher who believed in discipline. He was also a known cross-dresser, and everyone in the neighborhood knew about it. He also wasn't very shy about this. He was known to be very flamboyant. Marvin and his siblings got teased a lot for this, and also because of the fact that their last name was Gay, and it was originally spelled just G-A-Y until Marvin added an E on later. Marvin found comfort in music. He started singing in the church when he was about five years old. Marvin Sr. used to get bitter when all the women would pay him attention, especially when they were paying more attention to Marvin singing than they were to the sermon that Marvin Sr. was giving. By the time Marvin was seven, his father was whipping him regularly. Once again, he found salvation in music. By his late teens, he was singing for money. His father hated it. He called it the devil's music. His mother, on the other hand, always supported him. She was like his symbol of unconditional love. Marvin's antagonism towards the government started at an early age. By 15, Marvin grew restless. He developed a skepticism about his society, and he became very aware of his city and the racial discrimination surrounding him, and he started to rebel against society. He started refusing to pay taxes. During Marvin's teenage years, his father would kick him out of the house often. Marvin decided to join the Air Force. He was kind of ashamed because he didn't finish high school, and he thought the Air Force would be an easy way out. It was not. Marvin found himself struggling with authority, and after eight or nine months, he decided to pretend he was crazy so that he could go home. He said that the only good part about being in the Air Force is that he finally got laid. He went to some crummy old building that had about four prostitutes for like 2,000 men, and he said that when it was finally his turn, the prostitute rushed through the job. This was Marvin's first time, and he felt kind of betrayed by this experience. He would actually struggle a lot with his sexuality and feelings of inadequacy. He himself said that his own sexual technique left a lot to be desired. He was shy about all the attention he got from his female fans, and that just turned his fans on more. He didn't know what to do with all the attention, but he knew that he had to keep up this image of the ultimate lover. Eventually, women would start throwing themselves at him, and he couldn't say no to them. At first, it would be just one girl, and then he would start having threesomes and foursomes, and eventually it was like, how many women can one man please? He was a little bit intimidated by his brother Frankie, though. Frankie had a beautiful singing voice and was really good with getting ladies. Marvin was quoted as saying, Not only was his sexual apparatus a lot larger than mine, he also had a very good voice. His size worried me, and there was no telling how big his talent might be. Marvin's bandmates would ask him to let Frankie sing, and he always rejected the idea, like he was afraid that Frankie would outsing him. This put a subtle tension between them. After Marvin left the Air Force, he was forced to go back home to his parents' house, but he wasn't ready to face his father. 
He felt like a huge failure for leaving the Air Force, so he avoided his father and tried to crash on his friends' couches, and eventually it became clear to him that he had to start singing for money. In the meantime, he would stop back at his parents' house for a day or two and grab some clothes and food and see his mom. Him and his father would avoid each other. Marvin didn't want to see his father, and his father didn't want to see him. In 1960, Marvin gets in touch with Barry Gordy, who is the head of Motown Records, and Barry signed Marvin. In 1963, Marvin married Barry's sister, Anna. She was 17 years older than Marvin and was said to be like a mother figure to him. Everyone speculated that Marvin was just with her to get ahead in his career, and that wasn't untrue, but Marvin did really love her. Anna and Barry were two people who always believed in Marvin, and Marvin appreciated that. In 1966, Marvin started hooking up with Anna's 17-year-old niece, Denise Gordy, and apparently got her pregnant. As it turns out, Anna couldn't get pregnant, so Denise gave the baby to her Aunt Anna and Uncle Marvin. And it seems that there was no real problem here. Everyone was happy. Marvin and Anna wanted a baby, and Denise had one that she was happy to give up. So Marvin and Anna adopted the baby and named him Marvin Gay III. Marvin and Anna did their best to keep quiet about the identity of the baby's biological parents, but that secret did get out around 1985. Marvin was pretty successful at Motown Records, but he did have to put in a lot of effort to get the producers to listen to him. He was signed with them, but like, they didn't want to release Heard It Through the Grapevine, and they originally shelved it. Eventually, they decided to recut it and have Gladys Knight and the Pips record it, and that was a hit. So they released Marvin's version in 1968, and it quickly outsold Gladys Knight at over 4 million copies sold. And that became one of Motown's greatest hits. That success gave Marvin the freedom to write the songs that would make him a superstar. In the early 70s, the Vietnam War was at its height, and Marvin had this new creative control, so he decided to write the concept album, What's Going On? He took inspiration from the war and dedicated the album to his brother Frankie, who had fought in the war. Marvin thought it was a masterpiece. He was delving into a message about poverty, racism, and war. But once again, Barry Gordy hated it. Barry wanted upbeat, dancey music, so Marvin refused to record anything else until they released What's Going On. And they did in 1972. And of course, it was a success. So now we're in the early 70s, and Marvin is immersed in the L.A. music scene. It doesn't take long for Marvin to become addicted to cocaine. At first, he was just using a little bit, snorting it here and there. It wasn't long before he was freebasing it and out of control. Everyone around him noticed how he became irritable and paranoid. His marriage with Anna Gordy fell apart, but before the marriage fell apart, he started hooking up with 16-year-old Janice Hunter. Janice and Marvin met while Marvin was recording Let's Get It On, which was a tribute to his sexual freedom. Janice's mother was dating one of Marvin's producers, so one day she brought Janice in to watch Marvin record. Afterwards, Marvin took her to dinner and bribed the waiter with a $20 bill to serve Janice cocktails. He then brought her to his home, and they had sex for the first time. Janice actually wrote a book called After the Dance, My Life with Marvin Gaye. And in it, she tells a story of them hanging out and getting high with another couple, and how the other couple is clearly sizing her up for an orgy. Marvin basically volunteers her, and he doesn't participate himself, but he acts kind of like a ringleader and just enjoys watching. And again, Janice is only 17 at the time, and she's eager to please him. But afterwards, she tells him that she wasn't into it, and he goes on to tell her how he really felt about it. He says... To watch purity turn into perversity is a fascinating thing. You were once an angel, but now you have fallen. And yes, I do admit, it is exciting to watch you fall. They would go on to get married and have two kids. Marvin's drug use increased, and he became more and more violent. One time, he put a knife to Janice's throat and told her, I beg you to provoke me so I can put us both out of this misery. So Janice took the kids and left. Around 1979, Marvin started to act erratically. His career had stalled and he had been spending a ton of money on drugs. He was also running from the tax man and at this point in his life, he's feeling really down about going through a second divorce and not being on good terms with his family. 
so he fell into a deep depression and his cocaine use got worse. He went to live out of a van in Hawaii for a while to kind of hide out. Marvin started getting really paranoid around this time, saying that people were trying to kill him. After living in Hawaii for a while, Marvin's really in debt and is forced to get back on stage. But the tour they had planned ended in a big scandal after Marvin decided not to show up to a show in Britain where Prince Margaret had been in the audience waiting hours to see him. So he decided to hide out again after that, and this time in Belgium. He's in Belgium for a long time, and eventually he writes Sexual Healing, and with the success of that song, he moves back to L.A. Marvin gets back on stage, but his paranoia is increasing, and he starts insisting on having his brother stand next to him at all times as a decoy in case anyone tries to kill him. Marvin's sister, Jean, actually says that Marvin moved back because he thought Janice's stepdad was going to kill him because he had beat on her. Needless to say, he's becoming paranoid of everyone around him. He even accused his own brother, Frankie, of trying to kill him. Marvin starts carrying a thirty-eight pistol with him at all times. In 1983, Marvin gave his father a gun to help protect him. At one point, Marvin had bought his family a big house in L.A., and Frankie lived next door with his wife, Irene. Marvin started getting really paranoid, and on one occasion, Marvin and Frankie got into an argument, and Marvin started shouting that he needed his gun and to get him his gun right now. So Frankie's wife, Irene, seeing how upset Marvin was, went and got the gun, and she took all the bullets out before handing it over to Marvin. Marvin immediately checks it and sees that the bullets are missing, and he starts freaking out, accusing Frankie of being against him. Marvin's relationship with his father only worsened over the years. Marvin Sr. was resentful of the fact that Marvin was successful and that he was able to buy the family a home. It was also because of Marvin that Alberta was able to stop working. It was like there was a constant struggle of who was the real head of the family. In 1983, Marvin Sr. went back to Washington, D.C. to fix up an old house. Marvin took this opportunity to go back home. It was said that the house was really peaceful during this time. On one hand, Marvin was really happy that his father wasn't around. On the other hand, he was really upset with his father because Alberta had to have surgery and Marvin Sr. just up and left. So Marvin stuck around to be there for her. Eventually, Marvin Sr. came back like nothing happened. The energy quickly shifted and the environment in the home became really hostile again. So much so that Marvin's sister, Jean, decided to move out because she could sense the trouble and wanted no part in it. Marvin lived with his parents in the big house in L.A. for the last six months of his life. During this time, he was very depressed and he would rarely leave his bedroom or get dressed. He looked like he hadn't slept in days and everyone said he looked like he just wanted to give up. In fact, in his last few weeks, people were starting to wonder if he was contemplating suicide. His sister Jean said that just four days before his death, he tried to throw himself out of a moving car. He was heavily using cocaine and had constant junkies and drug dealers coming in and out of the house. It was said that up to 20 to 30 people were coming over each day. Of course, Marvin's dad was pissed. On the morning of April 1st, 1984, Alberta and Marvin are hanging out in Marvin's room sitting on his bed. Marvin Sr. yells at Alberta from downstairs, asking her where some important insurance letter was. Marvin yelled back down the stairs that if he wants to talk to Mother, he better come upstairs and talk to her face. So Marvin Sr. comes up the stairs and starts yelling at Alberta again about the letter, and Marvin jumped in and started yelling back at him. The two of them started yelling back and forth, and Marvin starts telling him to get out of his room and shoving him, and then Marvin starts punching his father. Father goes down, and Marvin started kicking him. Marvin Sr. eventually gets up, humiliated, all respect for his authority gone. After a few minutes, Marvin Sr. came back into the room with a gun in his hand and shot Marvin. Marvin collapsed, and his father then steps forward and shoots him again at point-blank range. Irene, who lives next door, hears the gunshots. She ran next door, and Alberta collapsed into her arms, telling her, Father shot Marvin. Marvin was shot once in the shoulder and once in the chest. His brother Frankie rushes over, but he's cautious in case Marvin Sr. decides to keep shooting. Marvin is still conscious at this point, so Irene calls the paramedics and they arrive within 10 minutes, but they refuse to come in until they know that the gun is no longer inside the house. 
So Irene finds Marvin Sr. and he's sitting there calmly and she tells him that she needs to take the gun so that the paramedics can come in. So she's like, Father, where's the gun? And he says, What gun? She said it was like nobody was home. So she looks under the pillow and she finds the gun there. A good 20 minutes pass before the paramedics can get to Marvin. He died in transit to the hospital. The paramedic asked Irene, Do you know his name? And when she said, It's Marvin Gaye. He looked at her and said, You don't mean the Marvin Gaye. And she said, Yes. And then the paramedic started to cry. I'm going to play a clip here from David Ritz, who is Marvin Gaye's chosen biographer. This is him telling the experience of him hearing the news on the radio. I remember coming out of a baseball game on that day on April 1st, April Fool's Day, and hearing on the radio Marvin Gaye's, you know, father has shot and killed Marvin. And I thought to myself, that's how he's going to do it. Oh, my God. That's so Marvin. That's so perversely brilliant. Marvin Gaye Sr. pleaded no contest to voluntary manslaughter and received a five-year suspended sentence. He originally claimed that he had shot Marvin in self-defense. However, that was determined to be untrue because of the fact that Marvin took a step forward and fired a second shot after Marvin was already down. With that said, everyone agreed that it didn't make sense to stick him with a long prison sentence because his health was already deteriorating and they thought it would be a death sentence and that it wouldn't do anyone any good. This is one of those terribly tragic cases in which a young life was snuffed out yes. and apparently a young life which was fairly productive in the field of arts and entertainment. And under the circumstances, it seems to be agreed by everybody, including the very able and experienced investigating officers in this case, that the young man who died, died tragically, provoked this incident. And it was all his fault. You're free to go. The investigators believe that this would be an isolated incident and that he posed no threat to society. Alberta divorced Marvin Sr. and he passed away while living in a retirement home. Marvin Gaye remains one of the most influential musicians of all time. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Broken Limelight. If you'd like to follow me on social media, you can get updates on new episodes at facebook.com slash ddwestlv. Bye!